Well, greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York, side of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. And it's a place where we originate these virtual programs. Today, we will feature one of our virtual curator spotlights. We'll be talking to one of our curators, John O'Dell, about a new display that has just recently uh, been uh, put up on the second floor here at the museum. It's all about fantasy baseball. We're very glad that you could uh, join us for the program. I uh, just want to remind you about an upcoming program just two days from now. On the uh, 10th of June, we are going to feature virtual voices of the game with longtime friend of the Hall of Fame, Marty Appel, uh, formerly worked in the front office of the New York Yankees, uh, started with the Yankees answering fan mail for the great Mickey Mantle back in the late 1960s. Uh, we'll talk to Marty about his long career with the Yankees, uh, working in the commissioner's office, uh, also, some of the many books that he has written. He's written some terrific books, including A History of the New York Yankees, Pinstriped Empire. So that's coming up on Thursday, June 10th, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, right at this uh, same channel, if you will, from the Baseball Hall of Fame. But today, our spotlight will be on uh, something we're doing in the museum itself, uh, a new display, as always. These programs are brought to you through the generous support of the Ford Motor Company, and we do thank Ford Motor for sponsoring these programs, allows us to bring them to you free of charge. Uh, today, we are joined by uh, John O'Dell, who's been a frequent guest. Uh, uh, he has done a number of spotlights um, more recently, uh, doing a program about the um, Autumn Glory exhibit that we yeah, feature, yeah, the we Los Angeles Dodgers World Championship from 1920. But today we are going to be talking about something very different, fantasy baseball. And you can see part of the display uh, uh, pictured on your screen right here. Uh, John, as always, we uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the program. Let's talk a little fantasy baseball over the next hour. And um, let's begin by talking about a guy pretty instrumental to this yeah. whole cottage industry, if you will. A man that might not be a household name to baseball fans, but should be. His name, yeah. Daniel Okrent. Tell us about him, if you will, John. Yeah. So um, uh, Dan Okrent is a, uh, a, a baseball lifer, loves baseball, uh, publishing executive. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> about 40 years ago, came up with the idea that to, to take what people already knew, and that's uh, games like... Um, uh, Stratomatic, and instead of using historical stats, change it into a a, a real time, season long game. So, of course, the beauty of Stratomatic and other games is you can you know you can blow through, you can play a whole game in in twenty twenty five minutes. But uh, the beauty of what uh, Daniel Okert was looking at was something that allowed you to uh, really go head to head and say, here's who I want this year. Um, anybody can pick, you know, like a great guy from last year, but how about let's, let's figure out who's going to be great this year. And, uh, that was the, um, uh, the impetus for what we know today is fantasy baseball, originally called rotisserie baseball for reasons that we'll get into. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, Daniel Okrent, uh, came up with the idea, refined it, worked with, uh, worked with his colleagues to, to refine it. And uh, really, uh, two things. One, des deserves the, uh, the recognition. And secondly, I, I want to mention, uh, was just extraordinarily helpful uh, and instrumental in uh, helping me understand greater the nuances of uh, rotisserie baseball, fantasy baseball, how it all came together, uh, and uh, drawing me into that original group that, uh, that first played uh, rotisserie baseball back in the 1980 season. So Dan's still around today, but back yeah. uh, 40 years ago, he was not a baseball guy per se. He was a publishing executive who just happened to be a fan of the game, right? That's right. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And But figured that there, and, and wrote about the game, uh, wrote about baseball, um, uh, but figured that there was a, a, a way to make the game even more uh, immediate uh, and, uh, and 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 raise the stakes a little bit. Uh, who really who really was smarter than George Steinbrenner? 
So this started with the 1980 baseball season. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Now his team name, I love it. Tell us about his team name. So his his team name was the Oakland Finokies. Uh, obviously a, a a playoff of Pogo in the Oki Finoki uh, swamp. Um, and uh, when you, and it sort of set the stage when you look at fantasy teams today. Invariably, they've they've got a a twist on. Uh, something related to the owner. People don't just go for the Orioles or the Cardinals. Those names are already taken. You know, you want something that that speaks to yourself and and speaks to who you are, where you're coming from, your love of the game, and and where you're starting. So, uh, the uh, you had the the, the Oakland Finokies uh, and and a number of other games, but usually, in some way, shape, or form, uh, often your name or something about where you're from. Uh, woven in uh, and, and try to create some sort of a fun pun off of that. Now, my understanding is they use the National League only. That's what That's right. they kind of follow in putting this, this rotisserie league or fantasy league together. I'm trying to recall at the time, I think there were 12 National League teams. There were 14 American at the time. That's right. So he and basically just a group of friends, I, I don't know if they were all local to his area. Maybe some of them did it long distance. Yeah, but basically, they, he and a group of friends got together and competed against each other. That's exactly what it was. And uh, and they were all uh, local to the New York City area um, and uh, got together for their first uh, for a, a draft and then began the process of uh, tallying. Um, in informally each day, but formally each week, the uh, the stats uh, based on the the stats being published in the sporting news, and that uh, for those who um, uh, haven't been around quite as long as uh, Bruce Markson and I have been, uh, was the the uh, the Bible of uh, baseball, and that was where you those were the the stats that you could get. Nowadays, mm-hmm. we just call up the stats, and we'd think nothing of it to be able to call it up on our telephones. Um, but at that time, the only place that you could get uh, good stats, real stats, stats that you could parse and and kind of work with was the sporting news and so you had to have a subscription and uh and and there they were and on all the box scores of all the games of the previous week um and uh so that was the um that was sort of the 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 beginning of that and as great as the sporting news was carrying all those box scores you know they weren't completely up to date 100 real time i mean they were that's right they had a lag of probably I don't know, five, six days. So right. they were somewhat behind. So that meant the fantasy league was a little bit behind what was actually going on. Right. I'm guessing these guys didn't use any computers. This was all done by hand. All done by hand and uh, and hand and fax. Uh, and so you would, you would if you had uh, changes that needed to be made, you faxed them into the commissioner. So that you could have somebody, you know, you needed to take somebody and put them on the DL, uh, put somebody else in. You needed to trade somebody. Uh, that was you. It was all by, done by those um, by that old-fashioned technology. Amazing what they were able to get done. All right, we're going to go back in time a little bit further now uh, as we continue to explore this new display at the Hall of Fame. So here we have something uh, that falls into the category of baseball's home games. And it's something called parlor baseball. And actually that is two different words, base and ball. So this has got to take us back to the 19th century. Yeah, it does from 1878. And parlor baseball is one of the very earliest um, uh, games. As a matter of fact, it's the, uh, it's considered the second oldest known game. Um, And, uh, there are there, there's one that's known to be older, and then there are a couple that are at least um, that were at least published about or advertised, but we haven't seen any examples of them. So anyway, this very very old one. A couple of things to note, and this is uh, uh, one of the elements that is fun just in in looking at uh, material culture, old artifacts from back in the day. If you look at the catcher, you'll see that he's wearing no glove, uh, certainly not a mitt. Um, Mitts were invented in the late 1880s. 
Um, uh, he's got no no mask. Uh, the mask was uh, invented the same year that the that the game came out. So the game was already designed and uh, and issued before the mask uh, 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 was was patented. Um, no shin guard, no chest protector. So uh, there's uh, the catcher there on the left in, in all of his glory uh, waiting to field the ball. Uh, but uh, just, you know, and, and, a, and a great design. So this is the cover of the game, and it's actually closed. We're going to see what it looks like when it's opened up. And it, it looks like a beautiful wood finish on this product. Yeah, it is. It's a wood, it's a wood box, uh, nicely finished, nicely pol polished, and with, uh, with, with, uh, pretty gold detailing on it. So let's take a look what uh, it appears like when it's opened up. Yep. And we can see that it's uh, it's got two sides to it. When I see this, I'm reminded of backgammon. You know, you can carry backgammon around like a briefcase and then you open it up and it's got two compartments, left and right side. This one is very similar. So we've got two things going on. We've got a playing field on the left. And then on the right, we have what is very elaborate and decorative and intricate. And you tell me that that is a spinner. So let's, right. let's talk about the uh, insides of this game. So this is, uh, this is a typical game. And this is where, uh, this is, if you want to go proto uh, rotisserie, proto roto, this is where, uh, this is before that even. So uh, everything is going to be, uh, every batter has an equal chance all the time. And uh, so this, the spinner, uh, each one of those rings, red, blue, yellow, and green uh, mean different things depending on how many batters are, uh, how many base runners are on. You spin this, the spinner and it tells you what's going on, but it doesn't matter if you're, you know, there, there's no such thing as a slugger or a punch and Judy hitter. Everybody is the same. Uh, just to orient you a little bit, you'll see you're, we're standing actually in the, in the, uh, in the bleachers behind center field, so to speak, uh, the way this is oriented and uh, the, the pitcher right there in the middle, uh, you can see the, uh, the catcher way behind uh, the batter. The, uh, the umpire over to the side uh, carrying an umbrella, uh, keeping the sun off, and a single bench. Actually, it was only later on that uh, dual benches were required for baseball. It started off as like, well, here, here's a bench. Everybody sits on it. Um, you know, the, the team that's in the field doesn't need a bench. Uh, so that was sort of, the I think, the, the rationale. And one thing that's kind of neat, too, for those who remember – um, some of the oldest rules of baseball, you'll notice that the, um, that the corner infielders are not playing where they quote unquote ought to be playing hmm. uh, because uh, back in 1878, when this game was created, there was something that was called the fair foul ball. And nowadays we know that if you if your ball starts in fair territory, but then curves out into foul territory before it gets to the base, that's a foul ball, right? You know that. I know that everybody knows that it's been the way since the very beginning, but in fact, it hasn't been that way since the very beginning. Originally, if that ball ever touched in the infield, it was a fair ball, no matter where it went out. And so uh, many ball players actually got pretty good at putting a, a nice little check swing spin on a ball so that it would uh, grab hold and then just spin uh, right out into the, what we would call foul territory now, but the basement basement had to get to that uh, yeah. because it was a fair ball if it had started uh, inbounds. And you can imagine uh, how much uh, uh, more action you end up with uh, if, if that were the, if that were the case, maybe we should uh, send that one over to, uh, to the commissioner of baseball and have him reinstate the fair foul rule. What do you think, Bruce? That would, that would put some, uh, uh, that would change the, uh, the, the shift a little bit, wouldn't yeah. it? It absolutely would. Um, you know, when you look at this, it actually looks like a shift toward the left side of the infield. When you're looking at it from the home plate, uh, you've got the third baseman is on the third base bag. Second baseman is right at the second base bag. Yeah. The shortstop is, of course, in between them. And then the first baseman is on the first base bag. So the second base hole is wide open. Yep. Now, I'm curious about the outfielders who look like they're very close to the infield. And the shape of the field is weird. It's like an oval. Yeah, I, I think it's it's simply a stylized way of, of uh allowing you to you see the in the bottom right hand corner of the uh, of our photo here, the the. Uh, the counters that you would use to to move around the 
the base paths. And I think that's uh, all we're doing is, is uh, you know, giving them a place to go. And the, the uh, otherwise, the, uh, the entirety of the board is decorative. Yeah. Almost looks like the shape of a cricket field more than a, a base. Yeah, it does. Yeah, actually, it really does, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, the right side of the playing board is, is so elaborate. Yeah. Well, let's, um, let's go I'm to not our sure. next frame and I'll, it, I'll, we'll take a look at that. Yeah. Does, does it take uh, uh, using uh, magnifying glass to read uh, all those intricate markings? It, it doesn't really take a magnifying glass, uh, but but you do have to. You, a, a little bright light doesn't hurt, if, yeah. especially if um, if you're a glasses wearer. But it's it's very it's it's very finely read. It's very clear, uh, but it's very small. Yeah, the colors are great. I mean, the, the colors really jump out, even all these years later. I'm curious, John, do, do we know how we got this uh, this old version of the baseball game, the parlor baseball game? Yeah, this was a um, uh, this was a donation uh, to us back in uh, back in 2000. As uh, like uh, uh, basically, you know, like all the things that we have here it was uh, a, a donation to the to the Baseball Hall of Fame from a fan who and I don't recall the right now who with the donor was who felt like this was something that we ought to have. And, uh, you know, we're not just about bats and balls and gloves here at the hall. Yeah. That's a very important thing to gain the, on the field, but the connection between the fan and the game. And of course that's what fantasy baseball is, is a, is a, a brand new connection between the fan and the game. So everything in this game is based on the spinner, no dice at all. Correct. That's right. No dice at all. Just the spinner. All right, very good. So this, um, the parlor baseball game, which was created in 1878, and again, considered the second oldest known of these uh, baseball board games. Um, let's take a closer look at the, uh, the playing field here, just in case folks could not get um, a full perspective with right. the earlier image. Uh, you did mention about the, uh, the players uh, on the bench, and they both teams shared the one bench, which I think is great. Um, and they're just the one umpire uh, who's holding, as you said, uh, the umbrella. And all of that is accurate to the time period, correct? That's right. That's right. And then, uh, yeah, and then there's our, uh, the, the design for the, uh, uh, for this, the spinner still works, by the way, this game, uh, the, the spinner still works. It's a, it's a, a, a fun little balanced piece that, uh, that balances out the long, uh, the long pointer, you know, it's really clear which side you're, you're looking at. And, um, uh, this, you know, goes around and you just, you just spin it and, and, uh, it, it works wonderfully, uh, except that, you know, it, it does, as we noted a moment ago, um, you've got the same, the journeyman and the cup of coffee guy and the September call up have the same chance of, of hitting a, a, a home run or striking out as Ty Cobb, Hannes Wagner, Babe Ruth, uh, or any of those 19th century guys uh, who were not quite so famous to us today. Yeah. Now, you did mention the spinner still works, so you curators tested it out, huh? Oh, you betcha. You know, we can't, we can't be putting these things out if they're, uh, uh, if they're flawed. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's in an incredibly good shape, and you consider the age on this, 1878 to 2021, just a remarkable piece that is a part of this uh, display. Uh, here's another interesting game that actually bears the name of one of our original Hall of Famers elected in 1936. This actually, though, came out before Walter Johnson was elected to the Hall of Fame. This is a game, uh, dates to 1930. Right. And um, interesting, though, that... Um, now we see it's it's baseball one word as opposed to two, so that change has been made. Yep, and so this yeah from 1930, uh, Walter Johnson. So it's a a, a sponsored game, the only game with a million dollar publicity. So uh, mm -hmm. clearly, it must be a great game if they're spending that much uh, money on it. But uh, one of the things it's it's uh, basically it's a dreidel um, uh, with uh, with the the men. Uh, are contained inside the, the little spinner. You can see that in the, uh, in the illustration uh, for the advertisement that would be um, uh, taped up or, or propped up inside the store is what that, uh, what that was for. And uh, you know, there's, there's a ball field, but 
you know, you really don't need anything more than that. You could put the, the entirety of the, this game in your pocket and with a pencil and paper uh, play with, uh, play with your friends. And, uh, and that would be great. So uh, again, a very simple, uh, very simple game, uh, not, uh, not complex. Uh, there's no strategy to it. It's either, you know, you, if, if you get a strike, you get a strike. And, and if you have a, a, a fly out, then you've got a fly out. But there's no, uh, there's no way of, of doctoring uh, your lineup in order to create, uh, to create runs. Yeah. John, I have a vague idea of what a dreidel is, but give us a better explanation. Sure. Than this, is, this is a, well, I, I was referring to the dreidel, the, um, uh, uh, the Jewish children's toy that you spin uh, at, at Hanukkah time and, and yeah. uh, you get a, get a prize for uh, whatever uh, comes up. But, you know, basically this is just a spinning top and whatever, uh, whatever came up on top was what you uh, got a chance to, um, uh, to, to, you know, that, that was the, that was the play. Do we know if this was the first game that actually bore the name of a player? Yeah, we know that it's not. Uh, there yeah. are uh, a number of them, even back in the 19th century, uh, that, um, that used players' names. It's not always clear, uh, as is the case here, it's not always clear when players were compensated for the use of their name and not. Obviously, uh, in this case, he was... We know that he was there. He went on a, a, a tour promoting the game. Mm. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so this is, but it's, it's part of this uh, marketing uh, niche of player promotion. Uh, and, you know, we see that in so many things today. I love some of the terminology that we see on the right side of the screen, two baggers, three baggers, base on balls instead of walks. So it does give you the feel of baseball in the 1920s and 30s. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Johnson did get uh, compensated. Um, any idea what that might have been, or is that a mystery? Uh, you know, uh, that is, I think that's in my um, my notes on this artifact, but I don't have those with me right now. And of course, it does I can't. Have not I can't only so a short answer is I can't tell you off the top of yeah. my head. It has not only his name, but it also does clearly have his image. Uh, and kind of a classic image of Walter Johnson from his days with the right. Washington Nationals uh, or Washington Senators uh, franchise, oh, yeah. right. I should say. Um, then we see a change uh, shortly after the Walter Johnson game comes out. Beginning in 1931, we begin to see games that are a little more realistic, reflective of the numbers, real life numbers. That's right. So now what we've got... This is a national pastime. This is the first game that uh, that uses real stats, and and the creator of uh, of this game uh, used actual batting stats from 1930 uh, and actual players, and to so that you would essentially recreate the 1930 series a season. Pardon me, in 1931. So that's what that's what's going on here. So. Mm. You, you you roll dice and uh, and what those dice said uh, would determine what the play was and so you've you've got now uh, uh, you know a lot more opportunities for uh, for things to, um, uh, to to happen you know it matters which die you're using so the one three is different from the three one so you know you were, we're talking about the the uh, the combinations, permutations that, uh, that maximize the, uh, the opportunities for you to have as many different kinds of plays as you can. Uh, but the, uh, the most important thing is that you could pick, uh, Bruce, you could pick your nine favorite players. I would pick my nine favorite players. Um, it's only about batting. There's no pitching involved here, but uh, at least we've got a chance at, um, at deciding, you know, Who's the better general manager from that perspective? Uh, I'll pick mine. You pick yours, and let's let's go to it. You see, the face card is for an outfielder named Elwood English. I have to admit, I'm not familiar with his career, uh, but uh, trust he was a player in the uh, in the league back in uh, 1930. Kind of looks like a primitive version of a Stratomatic baseball card. You know what? When we get as we move forward, we'll see that the APBA and the Stratomatic both are using this as a template. Now this one uh, uh, didn't, um, 
was not a successful game. Uh, it didn't sell very well, and uh, uh, you know, and and it's uh, very, um, uh, it's a very rare game, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, it, it you, you'll you'll see a lot of things come up that, that look like this. It, it was a nice marker to start off with. Yeah, Woody English, I just now looked him up, uh, Chicago Cubs uh, ball player. And in, in, uh, in 19, uh, 1930, had his career year, as a matter of fact. So, Oh, Woody. Okay. Woody English is actually a name I've heard of. Uh, okay. Elwood yeah. fooled me. <laughs> Elwood. So yeah. So yeah. Now what about that? What's that thing on the left-hand side? It's kind of uh, yeah, reddish or pink and yellow and green. What is that? That's that's the now uh, breaking down uh, shaker that was used to shake the dice in. Oh, okay. So yeah, if you know from like you remember from Parcheesi or some of yeah. your other dice games where instead of you know just doing it in your hand, you have to do it in a little shaker. That's what that is. That's the little shaker. Oh, very cool. Very nice. All right, here's um, yeah. another very colorful item. Uh, it's called the All-Star Baseball Game, and it features a player, Ethan Allen, not one of our founding fathers, but a major league player. This one is introduced about 10 years later. This is 1941. Uh, how is this an advancement over the last game that we saw? So uh, it's an advancement in, in a couple of ways. Um, it is. Uh, it remains batters only so it's not uh an advancement in that way but it, the uh rather than using a using dice it has a spinner and uh the size of the um of the little circles that you would place it over the lower right hand side says at bat and you would spin that and then uh you it would uh it was calculated statistically calculated so that you would get the proper number of uh, home runs, singles, doubles, triples, uh, fly out, strikeouts. Uh, and that was the, uh, the rationale here. Um, and, uh, like I say, again, this is a, um, uh, a batters only, uh, thing, but there are some opportunities for, uh, some, uh, in a, in a slightly more advanced version, uh, some situations that, that could come up and you could, uh, you could spin another spinner for the for those situations. So uh, the the mechanism uh, is different, but the idea is the same, and that it's you you you're getting some control over your lineup, uh, which you didn't have in those first games. You don't have in the Walter Johnson, uh, but that you will have ultimate control of once we get to uh, uh, rotisserie and fantasy baseball. John, I think it's interesting the player that they made an agreement with, Ethan Allen. Uh, he was a, a, certainly a decent player, but we're not talking about a Hall of Famer. We're not talking about one of the hallmark players of the 1940s. You know, you would think a lot of these board games, they have been associated, carry the name of Hall of Fame, you know, immortal type players. Yeah. I guess people would say, why Ethan Allen? And there's a good reason for that. Ethan Allen actually invented this game. He sketched it out. He invented it while he was playing baseball. He thought that this would be a great, um, a great home game. And this is not just an all-star baseball game featuring Ethan Allen. This is Ethan Allen's actual game that he invented. He created. Um, he's the uh, the he's the patent guy on this. Wow. So that's why it's Ethan Allen's all-star baseball game. And uh, so we're, hmm. we'll give uh, we'll give all due credit uh, to Ethan Allen later uh, sold with Cadeco. And, and uh, uh, but uh, that's the you know, you wouldn't think, uh, you know, in the 1930s, you could come up with a, and, and early 40s, you could come up with, uh, you know, a, a better uh, person to wave your banner than Ethan Allen, except that he invented it. So he gets yeah. to put his name on it. Oh, that's great. That's amazing. Um, here we see some of the uh, the cards, if you will, uh, circular in shape. And you can see um, a few different guys represented in this game. Yeah. Uh, we've got uh, DiMaggio, Feller, Ott. Uh, do we know if they – did they have every player in the league or just selected players? Yeah, you had um, – uh, every player was available to you. So uh, I, yeah, I say that um, – I'm going to say that every regular was available yeah. to you. I, I'm, I'm sure that there were any number of September call-ups and, and uh, journeyman guys who, uh, you know, who, no, who just wouldn't get into a game except in a pinch-hitting situation. 
I would imagine that there were a number of fellows who were not included. But basically, you've got uh, your all of your starting lineups and your and your major substitutes. So uh, the the better part of the entire entirety of the league available to you. John, if tell you us how the here, numbers work on these cards. Yeah. So each one of these um, uh, numbers represents a, uh, a a different batting situation, and I'll give two because uh, they're right next to each other, uh, which is which is fitting in, in a lot of ways because the number one is, is home runs and the number 10 is strikeouts. And so you can see that Bob Feller is more likely to strike out. Well, he's also more likely to strike you out, but uh, this is as a batter. So he's more likely to strike out than he is to hit a home run. And uh, on the other side, uh, you see Joe DiMaggio is uh, very, very, very likely to put the ball into play. And so all of these numbers are different kinds of things that, that will take place uh, their, their ground ball, fly ball, uh, fly ball outs. Uh, but the, the 10 is just a strikeout. And, uh, you know, you see, um, you know, the, the idea that they put those two next to each other so that if you're, if you're shooting for a, a, a home run, you've also got the chance of striking out. Uh, of course, nowadays, if we were to do that, we probably would put the 10 on both sides of that one, because that's, uh, all anybody does right now. Yeah. It's a lot of outcomes, 14 different outcomes. So this was quite a detailed game. Yeah, it was. It's a de detailed game. And it's still, by the way, um, the, the, the Ethan Allen game, the APBA game, which we'll come up uh, with next, and the Stratomatic, all are still active and people remain uh, fans of them. Uh, not all of them are being uh, actively marketed, but there are cottage industries where people create uh, using stats, uh, the, the, the new dials that they need, uh, or the new cards, uh, that they need to, uh, to be able to, to play, uh, and, and keep up with the game. So you can, you know, you can still pick Mike Trout, uh, and, and, and put him on your ball club. Yeah, that's interesting. All right. Here's a game that, uh, kind of brings us more into the modern era. I'm sure we have quite a few viewers, uh, who have some familiarity with APBA. I never really played it all that much. I played it a little bit, but I know some people who are diehard APBA uh, fans. This is a game that dates back to the early 50s. Right. So 1951. Uh, so APBA took the idea of dice and cards uh, from... Uh, from some of those earlier games, and but they also added uh, some pitcher ratings uh, in uh, to uh, to enhance the game strategy. Uh, and so this is taking again, uh, you know, one step a little bit farther. Uh, each team available to you. So uh, on the left hand side, I, because this came out in 1951, I chose the Giants and the Dodgers, so that you can you know recreate that season and uh, and find out how many times the Giants win the pennant. Yeah. So this is reflective of what happened in 51. So this would have come out that winter. Uh, so this was, uh, this actually came out in 51. Oh, in uh, 51. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's. So we've got uh, Alvin Dark, who was a great shortstop with uh, the Giants and other teams. Cal Abrams, who played for uh, Brooklyn um, and some other clubs as well. So we see two of those players. Uh, yeah. that are featured there. I love the fact that we have the team envelopes, uh, Giants of 51, Dodgers of 51. That's great. Yeah. yeah. And then you can see, you know, once you're playing with, um, you know, knowing the, the, the two die, one of them is going to be the, you know, the, the first, uh, the first digit and the other, the second, but there's, there are quite a lot of, uh, of opportunities for, uh, for different things to happen. And then if you, uh, look on the right-hand side, for instance, you see 44 and 55 are both 8-1s. Uh, you know, that's the same play is going to take place. Uh, so there are multiple opportunities for, uh, you know, for more likely things to happen. So that's uh, uh, one of the things going on. And then uh, next, Stratomatic, um, which, uh, you know, really added uh, greater, more robust pitching and, and batting realism. It made it the go-to game for just a lot of, uh, of fans. It came out in 1961, uh, refined a couple of different times around 1960, first advertised in Sports Illustrated. Um, and then 1963 or thereabouts is really when it began to, to hit its stride. Um, uh, both Bob Costas and John Miller uh, have spoken at length 
about how they played their uh, their stratomatic games and called them. And that was one of the ways that they honed uh, their ability as uh, as broadcast uh, baseball broadcast announcers. Uh, and uh, I think that's uh, really John Miller in particular. I've heard a couple of times uh, uh, go on at, at some length um, uh, about being up in his bedroom and, and his parents uh, uh, wondering if if there was anything wrong with him. And uh, <laughs> he was he was totally satisfied and, and very happy and uh, then found out uh, a little bit later on that not only do you, can you broadcast baseball when you're a, a baseball broadcaster, but you can you can eat there, and that nobody cares what you dress. Uh, and and he saw he he saw that that was uh, pretty much the um, the ideal game for him. So uh, he 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 found his uh, niche using um, uh, using Stratomatic. Uh, again, this now is is, is in, in many ways viewed by a lot of uh, aficionados as the comedy. There are a lot more games. Uh, Sports Illustrated had a game. Um, uh, there was uh, 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 Catch the Yankees uh, was a was a game. There were a lot of of different, but these uh, three games in particular, All Star, APBA, or ATBA, and uh, and Stratomatic are are three that sort of um, uh, fill up the Venn diagram of uh, of these kinds of uh, of these kinds of uh, proto roto uh, games where you're picking, but it's all based on uh, on history. It's not based on exactly what happened today, and that's yeah. where we'll go now. You mentioned this a game first produced 1961, so Stratomatic is celebrating its 60th anniversary this year. This particular game that we see here looks very similar to a game I would have had in the 70s. The green and yellow board, uh, the cover. This looks like 70s, 80s vintage to me. I see the, the area for the split cards. I think they've since gotten rid of the cards and they've gone to like a 20-sided die, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, that, that I think they be. use that. So you don't have to shuffle the cards all the time. Right. Um, but this... Um, this this brings back a lot of memories. I'm sure not only for me, but from a lot of our viewers as well. Yeah. This one was actually you, you um, uh, was donated to us in uh, by Stratomatic back in '83. So mm -hmm. you're you're right on your um, uh, your, your senses of, of of nostalgia and and memory are, are right on, Bruce. One of the things we would sometimes do when playing this game is we would get the baseball cards for that year and just have them visually to add a little more uh, spice, if you will, to the, uh, to the proceedings. But you can see two of the cards that are on display here as the Atlanta Braves get set to take on the uh, Philadelphia Phillies. And this is based on 1982 pitching and batting records. Great right. stuff there. All right, let's, um, let's talk about this rotisserie revolution as you label it. As we bring the story back around to Daniel Okran, whom we mentioned right off the top, so let's start here with this um, this logo, this name, rotisserie. Where does it come from? What does it mean? So this is this is the beginning, really. So uh, all of what we've been talking about, and I'm sorry for the long uh, those of you who are ready ready for some fantasy baseball for the long lead in, but you know you you start getting your curator talking about history and you can't get him to stop. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so this is where uh, where fantasy baseball really uh, really takes off um, and it, it begins as rotis uh, rotisserie baseball. Uh, Daniel Okrant had, had once mentioned that um, uh, Stratomatic made life worth living. Um, and in the 1970s uh, was the beginning of, of free agency. Uh, and uh, s some people uh, may remember that uh, Reggie Jackson, before between Oakland and New York, spent a year in Baltimore, where he was paid the unbelievable, obscene amount of two hundred thousand dollars to uh, to play baseball. Um, and the very next year went to uh, New York where he made $3 million over five years. Uh, the, the point was that for the first time, uh, it was now possible to start figuring out what, what is the cost. You could buy a team uh, because there were actual free agents. Before this, uh, there, were no, there was no such thing as a free agent before, um, mm -hmm. uh, before Marvin Miller and, uh, and uh, Peter Seitz had, had created this, uh, this idea. Well, let me back up. 
there were, but it was only under strange and unusual circumstances uh, where the owner basically broke his contract with the, yeah. with the player. But otherwise, uh, generally speaking, you're owned by the team, you're owned by the owner. Uh, if you retired, he still owned you until he decided to let you go. So if you couldn't retire and then go to somebody else's team. You were owned by the team uh, uh, in perpetuity. And so now all of a sudden you weren't, uh, we had free agents, um, at the same time, uh, a fellow named Bill James, who is very famous now in uh, Saber metric circles, uh, started coming up with something called the baseball abstract. And he was uh, tearing apart and putting together stats in brand new ways. Um, and uh, this is one of the things that uh, Dan Okrent was also uh, uh, reading. Um, and uh, it it helped stimulate uh, Okrent's uh, mental idea of this idea that baseball players now are becoming something that you can measure in new ways. You, mm. you, you, it's, it's not just batting average. And so that's the traditional way, but there's, but there's more to it. And so uh, that's where the rotisserie revolution uh, takes off. That's where it begins is a uh, 19, uh, the very late seventies. And then in 1980 um, he, he pulls the trigger. If we go to the next uh, page, then I'll, we can talk about that. So there he is. Uh, so this is Dan Okren on the left. The um, uh, postcard on the right is La Rotisserie Restaurant. It was, uh, it is no longer, but it was a, a restaurant in New York City hmm. and uh, a place where uh, Dan uh, met and, and uh, with, with friends. And he sketched out this idea that he had developed that instead of using last year's stats or the cumulative weight of probability of last year's stats, let's go blank slate. We're going to use this year's box scores and the, the scores that are coming up each day. And you have to predict whether you're going to get somebody's banner year, somebody's career year, or if you're going to get a year in which they, they get injured in April and they're not any good the whole rest of the year, but they managed to stay on the field, uh, sucking the very life out of your fantasy team. <laughs> I love the old postcard here, La Rotisserie. Uh, I don't remember this restaurant, though I did live close to New York City uh, at the time. And there we see Okrent. You know you've made it in, in baseball as a fan when uh, you get your own card from Allen and Ginter, as uh, Daniel Okrent did back in 2014. Yeah. Um, here we see another one of the participants. I guess he was in the first year of that league. Right. And he ended up winning the championship. Is that correct? That's right. So this is Glenn Wagoner. Uh, also, the, the uh, uh, basically all of the group uh, that was associated with one another, they all knew each other through um, through publishing. And uh, so, you know, every profession is a small world, even in New York City. And so uh, these were uh, baseball fans who loved publishing, or, you know, who were professional publishers uh, working at various and sundry levels uh, as, as editors, publishers, um, writers. And so uh, uh, Glenn Wagoner, uh, he, he co-owned uh, his team with uh, a fellow named Peter Gethers. Uh, and so they named their name the Gethers Swag Goners. So Gethers and Wagoner come, come together for the Gethers Swag, the Goners hitting the home run. Um, and, uh, and they ended up winning the, uh, the, uh, the entire league uh, that year. Uh, you know, it's fantasy baseball. It's rot and rotisserie came from that restaurant. The name of the ro restaurant was the rotisserie restaurant. So that's why it's called rotisserie baseball. If they'd, if they'd met in the, in the Burger King, it would be called Burger King baseball, but it's not, it was rotisserie baseball. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the franchise fee was a pretty hefty sum is $250 for each of the, um, uh, uh, for each of the teams and, and, 1980, uh, $250 is now about 800 uh, due to inflation. Uh, and so, uh, and then it was broken down. Half of it went to the winner and the other half was broken down uh, among the, the next three places. So it, you, you wanted to be, there were eight teams. You wanted to be in the, uh, in the upper division, the first division. And, uh, and if you did, then you could recoup some of the money that you, you, you got. Um, and, uh, 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 Glenn Wagoner um, and, and Peter Gathers uh, did win. 
um, the uh, uh, the uh, the trophy uh, to the right uh, has been loaned to us uh, by um, uh, Glenn's son, and so we are very thankful for that. There are not a lot of three-dimensional artifacts related to actual fantasy baseball because actual fantasy baseball takes place pretty much in the ether now. I mean, it used to be that, you know, you would be writing down all of these uh, elements and, and it would take uh, reams of uh, three ring binder paper and, or a spiral bound notebook paper to keep track of all of the, uh, all the stats and you're adding everything up. But now it's all done electronically. Uh, the, the, uh, Barrier, entry to barrier is very, very low. You don't have to know anything about baseball. Honestly, you don't have to know anything about baseball. And, and uh, most of the people that I've been in my, uh, uh, my fantasy baseball league here at the Baseball Hall of Fame uh, take advantage of that on me because I don't know as much about stats and ball players. I just love watching the game. I'm just a, I'm a, I'm a fan of watching baseball. Yeah. Uh, I rarely figure out uh, who the best player is going to be next year. So there you go. Uh, but the, uh, you see that, um, that Glenn also got a, a card. So Dan Okren got it because he was the inventor of, um, of fantasy baseball, of rotisserie baseball. Uh, Glenn got it because he was um, the, not only was he the first winner, but that's not the reason he got it. He was also in many ways, the lifeblood of, of publicizing rotisserie baseball. He was the one who, um, who, Took the uh, took the game onto his shoulders and let people know about it. Uh, he wrote about it. He he um, shared the information about it. He ended up uh, writing the um, uh, the uh, editing the book uh, that that came on that explained how it worked. And of course, um, the 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 idea that all of these fellows had was that they'd be able to make uh, some money off of it. I mean, who wouldn't? Uh, yeah. But the game is so deceptively simple that there's just no way to do it. I mean, you're just using the numbers that exist and uh, you know, it's, you, you could, they could, uh, uh, they could, and they did uh, trademark the name rotisserie baseball. And uh, of course the, the media immediately figured out that if we just call it fantasy baseball, everybody's going to know what we're talking about and we don't have to give the other guys a dime. And yeah. so that's how we call it today. Fantasy baseball uh, rather than rotisserie baseball, but um, uh, kudos to um, uh to, to Glenn Wagoner and uh, and to all of those who that very first year uh, labored and sweated through uh, through a, a tough tough year and uh, and and created a game that uh, over 20 million people every year play now. One final point on this uh, slide here: the trophy that Wagner is holding in two of the photos is actually called the Wig Trophy, and that's a name that honors a guy named Larry Wig. Yeah. He was the sporting news editor, I guess, back in around 1980. And it was his work in compiling the weekly baseball stats for the sporting news that really provided the framework for following and, and keeping the players involved in this league. That's right. So Wiggy was the guy who, um, you know, was responsible for making sure that all the numbers were right. And this was their, um, uh, their, their tribute uh, to the fact that somebody had to do all of this. You know, it's like you... Uh, you, you needed to have all those stats in one place, and uh, and uh, you know somebody was somebody ordinarily was unsung, and so this was their yeah. their tribute to uh, to an unsung hero. Uh, was calling it the, the the Wiggy Trophy. And then, oh by the way, there was down at the bottom. You may have seen that was the champions uh, uh, dinner, uh, and they. Uh, the uh, Peter and, and Glenn uh, dressed in their tuxes and everybody else had to uh, fet them. Uh, and th this was the, this was the, the, the final, uh, the final dinner, the championship Thank banquet. You. All right, here we've got some very interesting images. I've <laughs> got to ask you about the scientist who baits the space alien trap with kerosene and acorns. And acorns. That's exactly right. So um, I, I mentioned uh, Glenn Wagoner, uh, helping to promote this game, right? You've got to get it, uh, get it out there to people. It's the greatest game uh, for baseball fans since baseball. It says so right on the book. And, and, uh, and he edited the Rotisserie League Baseball, which had all of the, uh, it told you how to play it. It gave you hints. It gave you stories. It told how each of the teams would, had been created in its first year. And then, you know, so that you could then uh, duplicate 
this game. In addition, uh, they uh, created a video so that if you were uh, a, a little had a little less attention to detail and you wanted it in a in a quicker thirty minute format, you could just uh, shove it into your VHS. And Reggie Jackson uh, showed you how to play uh, rotisserie league baseball, and they advertised that video uh, in uh, a variety of places. But one of my favorite ones was when I found out that it was in Weekly World News, um, uh, which, uh, you know, if if you're a, a Men in Black fan, as I am, uh, you may remember uh, that uh, there was a little uh, discussion at, at a newsstand and, the, and uh, uh, Will says, uh, it's like, Weekly World News, seriously? It's like, better reporting than the mainstream media, son. And so there you go. Better reporting than the mainstream media had Rotisserie League Baseball video in it. And uh, wow. so this is a, a 1991 uh, uh, clipping. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Weekly World News uh, had, uh, well, quite some interesting news stories. It never took itself too, too awfully seriously. Um, on the, on the left-hand side there, the fire Billy trade Reggie outwit George, uh, that came from the Sporting News uh, in 1984 and uh, telling you this is how to play um, uh, rotisserie league baseball and, and uh, encouraging you uh, to get the book and learn how to play. Let's talk about some of the publications, books that have come out as part of this fantasy explosion. Right. Um, and here we've got uh, uh, two really good books that a lot of our fans may be familiar with, Hidden Game of Baseball, and then also the Rotisserie Baseball Analyst from about right. 30 years ago. So um, among the earliest impacts to uh, Rotisserie Baseball is how it encouraged fans to accept and apply this growing body of uh, baseball related stats called Sabre Metrics. Sabre being the Society of American Baseball Research. Um, and uh, Bill James began with a, a, his own uh, uh, seminal uh, research. Pete Palmer and John Thorne, uh, a statistician and historian, uh, took the growing power of computers. Uh, they applied it to the national pastime and uh, start figuring out ways to tell you a little bit more, uh, help you tease apart why some players are better than others. It's like, you know, that some players are getting, uh, why is this with one guy who has an, uh, on uh, a batting average of something and another guy has the same batting average, but you would prefer to have one over the other. Um, and the, yeah, some of those numbers are going to be the same. Some of them are going to be different. And that's where you, know, they started uh, with this hidden game of baseball it's sort of, um, tearing the veil apart or pulling, pulling the veil apart so that you could understand the game from a slightly different perspective. And you, they started creating the, you know, the, some of the new stats that have come along uh, and then fans um, of fantasy baseball began taking these as well and saying, you know, th this is a way that now I can win my, pardon me, win my league mm -hmm. is by uh, taking some of these uh, stats, even though, uh, batting average might be one of the stats. If I uh, if I combine that with some of the others, I may be able to find a uh, somebody who is more likely next year to maintain his batting average and and hit more uh, RBIs and home runs and maybe you know who's going to steal bases that kind of thing. So uh, that's what the hidden game of baseball is. The um, 1990 base, rotisserie baseball an, uh, analyst um, it promised you uh, in-depth evaluations and strategies and, and how to win. Um, later on, you know, the, inter the internet companies start relieving the drudgery of keeping stats by hand. Uh, they, more and more uh, magazines and websites are created. New stats uh, become, uh, you know, as everybody tries to differentiate and try to find um, what the right stats are. And one of the things, by the way, that, you know, there's a, there are a certain set of, st of stats, you know, the, the um, uh, batting average and runs and um, uh, stolen bases uh, and uh, uh, RBIs that for, for hitters and strikeouts and wins uh, uh, for pitcher ERA, um, Daniel Okren created whip. Uh, he invented that, uh, that stat. Uh, as a, a more granular way of uh, identifying um, 
a strength of a pitcher since so much of ERA is team dependent and situation dependent and, and not as, as pitcher dependent. But the thing that's really neat is that at, once he figured out these stats, then he, he, um, he backward engineered them and found that they accurately predicted the, the, um, the, the, the placement, the finish of the teams for the previous uh, half a dozen years in the mm-hmm. National League. And so that was how the, those original stats that we now think about in fantasy baseball got started was because they actually worked. And so if you were, if in fact you had a team that did all of these things and you got your scores and you, 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 you were the best in each of these categories, not only were, would you win this game, but your, your real team, if you fielded it would actually win the national league. Yeah. Something that continues um, to this day, all sorts of fantasy guides, some fantasy guides and internet though as well. Yeah. And uh, you know, one of the things that uh, that's happening now, the, the billion dollar fantasy uh, high stakes game, uh, FanDuel and DraftKings. That's the, you know, the newest thing that's out there. So there uh, is a lot of uh, uh, gambling on, uh, on fantasy baseball and uh, now you can even do um, uh, daily fantasy sports where you just rather than doing it for a whole season, uh, you just pick the games today and you pick your lineup. And by the end of the day, you know whether you've won or lost. So uh, it is uh, far more um, uh, responsive uh, to that. So, you know, uh, it's gone from, uh, you know, way back in the day when all you were doing was spinning a spinner or spinning a top to uh, uh, finding out in real time uh, whether you're making or losing money, uh, depending on whether somebody uh, has, uh, you know, one strikeout or 10 strikeouts. And uh, if they get 10 strikeouts, then maybe you'll, uh, you'll win the day. John, we have just a couple of minutes left, but we do have a few uh, messages in the chat room to get to. Terrific. One comes from Stephen Cheskin. Uh, He writes, in 1977, I sent away for a booklet from an ad in the Sporting News or another baseball publication where you scored points each day based on how players performed in real life. This actually predates the Daniel Okren game. Oh, yeah, it sure does. We have used the system since and continue to play under those rules. We used the daily paper for years until finally putting the point system into Yahoo and having the computer keep track. So I was not aware of that, but that apparently goes back uh, even a little bit further than rotisserie baseball. You know, uh, I have, uh, and this is not the first time that I have been made aware of uh, a number, th- there were a number, uh, it was of course, obviously it's a number, uh, but there were a few uh, other folks who had come up with very similar ideas and uh entirely independent of one another uh another yeah. uh, uh group in chesapeake virginia uh that had done it and uh this I, i'm i'm thrilled that somebody has has come in and uh and, and obviously um uh Okrent came up with his as well uh which demonstrates i think uh the uh the reality that the time was right uh that you know here it is now you know at a time when you really could in the late 70s uh, begin the process of creating your own baseball club and, uh, you know, and using this, the stats from your look, from your daily paper to, um, uh, to compete with one another. We have a question from Vincenzo. He asks, hey, Vincenzo. were there concerns of fantasy teams uh, giving money to a guy they didn't know? I guess they're talking about the president of that particular fantasy league. Was there a contract or legal document of some sort in those early fantasy years? Did, so uh, they talked to Daniel about that. Yeah. So they, they all knew, uh, they knew one another and vetted one another. So uh, they were not unknown uh, to one another. And, and uh, they, they were all aware that, that, that the other guys were, uh, were crazy baseball uh, nuts as well. So uh, there was a, uh, a collegiality, uh, and a um, and a familiarity with with one another, so it wasn't quite the uh, the shot in the dark that if I if if I made it sound like that, it was not. They they yeah. were uh, even 
they didn't all know they didn't all know everyone, but everybody knew somebody. Yeah, and so that was how they. It's like, oh, I, we need another guy. Oh, I know somebody. Uh, I'll bring him in. We have a question from Dan. How long is the display going to be set up at the Hall of Fame? Uh, I've been playing APBA baseball since 1987. Uh, you were telling me earlier that this is this is a temporary display. Yes. Um, but it's going to be up for what at least the rest of the year, maybe beyond that too. Yeah, definitely the rest of the of this year. Um, and uh, we have not begun the process of uh, finding something to replace it yet. So uh, uh, I guarantee you, if you come uh, before Christmas, it'll still be up. Yeah. Uh, I I can't guarantee you after that. But um, I, I would uh, I would be shocked. Well, I, w- I would be shocked if it were if it uh, came down immediately after that. So uh, come this uh, that that's my call to action. Yeah. Uh, it's not a big exhibit, but it's 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 definitely worthwhile. Uh, if especially if you love uh, fantasy baseball, I think you'll find that it's a nice little uh, a nice little part of your of your visit here. It's up right now. It's up on the second floor, part of the whole new ball game exhibit, which That's is right. a terrific exhibit here. So it's a nice addition to that. Uh, it'll be up for summer and fall and at the very least into the early part of the winter, as you said, right up until the Christmas time. Uh, and it is about uh, fantasy baseball and the history of many of these games, starting with those early board games and then advancing into uh, more of intricate games like Stratomatic. And of course, ever popular rotisserie in fantasy baseball that is played today. John, as always, we thank you. Great stuff. We appreciate your time. Hey, Bruce, thanks very much for the invite. I, um, I'm always open. Uh, you know, you've got my, my dance card. It's right there on, uh, on Outlook. So uh, give me a call whenever you want to do this again. Let's talk baseball. Yeah, and you're, you're in a league this year? You know, th- this year I'm not. Uh, not. I, I, I'm, I'm taking a taking a break from it this year. But the the hamstrung bums have have uh, is is are, are my team, and yeah. uh, sometimes they do well, and sometimes they're just bums. Yeah, I played one season. I think I finished second to last, and I decided I'd better retire before I get into <laughs> sure. trouble. So, yeah, I tell you, been, the, the it's main, been a lot the, of fun, John. We do appreciate your time. This. Insight into fantasy baseball, our new display up on the second floor of the museum. We also want to thank, in addition to John O'Dell, uh, the Ford Motor Company for their generous support of programs like this virtual curator spotlight and all the other virtual programs that we're delivering pretty much on a weekly basis from here in Cooperstown. Thanks, everybody, for being with us. Have a great day. Take care.